Welcome everybody to Mindful Social. This is the podcast where we talk about mindfulness and wellness and how it all comes together with social media. We're not always so sure. But this week I've got a good friend, Allie Stark. And Allie is a wellness coach, but I'll let you tell us a little bit about you, Allie, and, and what it is you do. Great. Thanks so much for the sweet introduction, Janet. It's nice to be here. Um, so I work as a health coach and a mindfulness educator, a writer, and a speaker. And I typically split my time between a private practice, both in Oakland and San Francisco, working with coaching clients on establishing tools and tips for optimal health. And I use mindfulness as the umbrella for how I go about doing that. Mm -hmm. And then I also give lots of talks in organizations and use my writing as a way of getting the way I view the world out into the world. Great, great. Well, thank you for being here. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the work that you do with organizations. What kind of things do you bring into an organization and, and how does that work? Sure, so I've been bringing in three separate things recently and I've been really excited about the bigger things that I'm building, but oftentimes a way that I get my foot in the door is simply through a talk or a lunch and learn. And I typically give an introductory talk on the foundations of mindful living. So really um, setting a framework for what is it to live mindfully mm -hmm. and what are all the different aspects of one's health that add up to make someone feel healthy, happy, balanced, and whole. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I expand upon that stuff. So I have longer half day and full day workshops as well as month long intensives that I've been bringing into companies. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been focusing on two general concepts. One is around courage and using courage as a means to take risks and uh, lead from a very authentic and vulnerable place. Mm. And then the other one I'm titling Human Flourishing, which is really just how do you tap more deeply inside of yourself in order to flourish and live the life that you want to live in a, in a really full way. So those are, those are the different programs that I've been bringing into organizations. Mm, that's great. Well, and let's talk a little bit about what you mean by courage. How does, how does that manifest itself? Yeah, so I think that the way that I view the world is we always have one of two choices. We either move from a space of fear or move from a space of love. And I find that when I work, <clears throat> excuse me, with any clients and we go deep down the rabbit hole, oftentimes what we find at the bottom of the rabbit hole is something that's related to fear. So a way that they're feeling held back. Mm -hmm. um, a framework or way that they view themselves in the world that's not actually based in reality, but is just in their perception of reality. And I always like to say, I don't really know what reality is. It's just the way that we tend to think of it, which may not be real at all. It's different for every person. So what I have found to be the antidote of fear is courage. And it is really cultivating a deep inner space inside of you that is uh, ferocious and I don't necessarily want to say fearless because I think fear is a really amazing catalyst mm. to create change. Um, but having the courage to really view an obstacle as an opportunity and to step into uncertainty and unknown, which is everything that exists in the future, right? So even 30 minutes from now is pretty unpredictable of what may happen or how things may unfold. And uh, building that muscle of courage to get people um, to the other side. Mm. And can you give us an example of, of how that's worked for someone and, you know, the transformation that you've seen them make? Sure. So um, I'm just thinking, I always like to be really cautious when I'm using client examples. Of course. Um, I have a client right now that I really adore. And... Um, I think a huge part of her life experience has been setting up a lot of rules for herself that were, of course, taught to her by her family or her education system, societally. Um, when I do this, then I need to do that, then I need to do this, then I need to do that. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of discontent 
in her profession, in her relationships, in her ability to self-care. Um, I oftentimes feel like I will experience clients say things like, I go into a job and my soul gets sucked outside of my body. Um, or it comes down to that sort of stuff, which is a very extreme thing to say. And so um, with this client in particular, one of the things that I really worked with her on is saying no when she doesn't want to do something. Mm. And I think that for so many of us, we feel a lot of social obligation. And this is also professional obligation. You know, having a boss come in, you already have too much stuff on your plate. Uh, you're someone who tends to people please or you've been taught to be a very high achiever. Mm -hmm. And so your rhythm and your pattern becomes saying yes, 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 yes. I'll take on more. Sure, I'll meet you for a cup of coffee. I'll fill all of this space. Mm -hmm. And what I find then is um, that these people don't have any space to feel. And when they do start to feel, it gets really scary, right? Because it's like I haven't had quiet uh, pauses in my life for so long because I've said yes to so many things uh, that I don't even know what to do with them. So uh, a lot of the work that I, I really do is teaching people to break rules because I don't actually believe that there's such a thing as rules. Um, <laughs> they're normally pretty self-created. and. Uh, giving people permission to really do what's in the highest truth from the, for themselves, even if it's disappointing anyone around them, even if it means that maybe they lose a job or they walk away from a relationship. Um, to me, it's utilizing courage as a means of really committing to your own integrity. Wow. Oh, and I think you asked a question of how have I seen this um, change her. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's a, it's almost a general energy, you know, it's, it's an energy of how I experience someone not to get too woo-woo on you at all. But I think you can see and really feel when someone feels contracted and shut down a little bit, right? Their body language tends to be a little bit more inward. Uh, and when I help these different individuals break rules, you see the fire inside of them brighten and all of a sudden there's just kind of an openness to how they present themselves into the world. Mm -hmm. um, and then they start to feel like anything is possible, right? It's like, if I quit that, this job, I won't be poor. Um, I won't be jobless forever. I won't be alone forever. Um, and I think it's just getting people to that first, like just to the edge of the cliff and then them feeling um, empowered enough to jump. Mm. Yeah, and the jumping is always scary no matter how empowered you are it's still pretty scary hell yeah of course it is it should be says, if it wasn't it's not important <laughs> gail says rule breaking can be a good thing and then she says jump 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 i agree gail <laughs> gail jumps a lot she's she's a very brave person as well so um I want to talk a little bit about what it's like to run a business that is mindfulness based, because I think people have a lot of um, assumptions about what it is to run a mindful business. And a lot of them I find are, are total bullshit. So, you know, it's, <laughs> it's easy for people to make a lot of assumptions, but let's talk about what it's really like um, running your business. Um, what kind of challenges do you come up with? You know, like when you're you're talking to a corporation, for example, about coming in and doing that lunch and learn and, and expanding your courses. Um, how does that work for you? Sure. Um, I think one of the things I'll do is give a little background because I think, um, so in my teens and early 20s, for a big portion of my life, I dealt with a lot of, chronic autoimmune illness. And um, it really wasn't a choice for me to self-care. It was like, if I don't self-care, I can't get out of bed oftentimes. Um, so although it was a, a very challenging thing to go through at a young age, I, I really think that it set me up for success in terms of what I consider my non-negotiables. And these are things that no matter what is going on in any other aspect in my life, um, 
I am un completely unwilling to give up because I know what happens on the other side, right? Mm. So I think that as that first question around mindful, leading a mindful business is knowing what is non-negotiable for you to feel good, to have consistent, sustainable energy, to um, notice your energy reserves, right? So oftentimes it's like if I've, I've had a long day with clients, I need to be alone and quiet for a long time afterwards to recharge. That's just how I recharge. Um, but so knowing those practices and also including, of course, nutrition and movement and sleep. Um, but so I think that I would say that my self-care is my number one priority. Um, pretty much above all else. And I think that, you know, I was more or less pushed into that and I now I wouldn't have it any other way because I, I really know how to manage that. Um, you know, and of course then things get really busy sometimes and, um, and noticing, you know, I think what I really try to do is notice when I'm feeling really like I'm falling into that cycle of busyness and I can't get enough done um, or I don't have enough time to get things done is thoughts really managing my thoughts. So using my own practices in uh, mindfulness to observe my own thoughts and parse out what's real and what's not. So the concept of time to me is um, we all have enough time and we can all get everything done. And it's simply about how are you prioritizing things in your life versus uh, the massive to-do list that includes everything. Mm -hmm. So I prioritize a lot. Um, I have learned things that I'm not that good at. I'm laughing as we started this um, little interview, like technology is not my jam so much. And also, you know, and Janet, this is one of the reasons why our paths cross is social media related stuff is something that I, um, struggle with more it's that I'm actually quite good at self-promotion but I'm not at, as good at um taking lots of pictures and posting on Instagram not my thing <laughs> well everybody has a platform <laughs> right and so I've learned uh to delegate and mm -hmm. to call in support when I need it and um to utilize that support not as something that I feel like I have to tightly control but calling in people where I know they're really going to shine and what I'm asking to have support in and really allowing them to take the reins and the lead in that. Uh, so yeah, go ahead. Part of your keeping well is really understanding that there are things that you can't, that you aren't best at and delegating those things. And isn't that part of how you can run an effective business through delegation, through focus, through prioritization? Is that kind of summing it up? Yeah, I think so. You know, and I feel like I'm learning. I feel like I'm I'm constantly learning something that I've been exploring recently. And I guess this is a very deep understanding of running a mindful business is observing that how I show up in business relationships is the same way that I show up in my personal relationships. Mm -hmm. And so I always find that some key piece that I'm um, – working on, right? So whether it's really sticking to my guns and speaking my truth, if I'm experiencing that with my partner or parent, that same pattern shows up professionally. Mm -hmm. And um, so I feel like part of me running a mindful business is having very deep commitment to my own self-work um, so that I really take responsibility for my actions and reactions and I was thinking one of the things you said, you know, sometimes working with organizations can be really challenging. And the first thing that came to mind is so often I send a proposal to a company and then I never hear back from them. After we've had multiple email exchanges, all of a sudden it's just like dead space. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And yeah. I used to take it really personally and I would do a very deep like, what's wrong with me? Um you know, where did this person go? Did I did I do something wrong? Were my prices too high? That whole thing. And now I've just sort of come into an understanding of like, everyone is really busy. <laughs> and things fall to the waistline and it's never personal. Mm. And that's been really, really helpful as well. 
That's huge because especially as, as solopreneurs, it's very easy to weigh on every single proposal as if the entire world is hanging on it. <laughs> and really it's not, you know, it would be really cool. But, and I also find that if you do that too much, you kind of setting yourself up for a fall because your expectations are really high and, you know, it may be unrealistic, you know, you're not going to get every proposal. It just doesn't always happen. So, and, you know, I think we all kind of take it personally as some mm -hmm. form of rejection if, if they don't get right back to you. So, yeah, I mean, it's just, um, I remember reading this article that said you should get rejected at least 100 times per year. Mm. And there's part of it that it's just a numbers game. It's like, right. Put yourself out there. Um, I feel like I got really good at this when I like was dating. Is that I just would like unabashedly put myself out there and get rejected and uh, realize that I survived. Mm. Yeah, the dating thing is the worst because I think uh, I I tell my son, okay, when you're ready to date, you're going to be ready to date, and then you know, you'll find people that are interested in you. But if you're really desperate for a date, it ain't going to happen. So, and I think it's the same way in business. The same if, way. Uh, you know, you're really struggling, then the vibes that you put out are completely different. You know, and I think that's part of, you know, going in with your authentic self that you really are presenting what they're going to get. And, and it's much easier to associate with that than, um, I think sometimes people put their sales hat on mm. and become a different person in order to sell their services. And then that's not what they get. You know, when they, when you walk into the room, that's, that's not going to work. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think also it's about clarity, right? So really getting clear. Um, I mean, I think in initial phases of building my business, it was like, I'll take anyone. <laughs> um, which I wouldn't necessarily give as advice to someone just starting a business. Just because you're just starting a business doesn't mean you have to take on anything that comes your way. Mm -hmm. but the clearer you can get about what it is that you want to draw in, um, the, the universe has your back. And it totally puts those people, it puts those people in your path and then the people you have tons and tons and tons of stuff to learn from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and let's not forget that every failure is a learning opportunity. Absolutely, yeah. But yeah, I, I think it's really important to decide who you want to work with and be able to to walk away. If you know it's not going to be a healthy relationship for you, it's not going to be healthy for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes you get those people that will come in and they'll lowball you for whatever reason. You know, they they want to get so much for free or they want to get, you know, five lunch and learns before you do you know, a, a paid presentation. And, and uh, I often find that if I take those, I'm resentful about it. And that's going to be projected into what I do. So I try really hard to, to be true to that. It's not always easy though, because, you know, yeah, we do need to, to pay the bills too. So it's such a it's such a balance between the two. And I think it's also, uh, you know, working as an entrepreneur or a contractor, it's like the nature of that business is up and down mm -hmm. and uh, really utilizing those spaces in those valleys um, to reengage in whatever you need to do that makes you feel really happy. Right. So actually spending time outside rather than sending a bazillion emails per day. Um, but also I think, again, it's resetting an intention, right? So why am I doing this? What are my values behind it? Um, you know, what if by getting this new work, how is it going to help elevate me to a higher level in myself? Mm -hmm. um, so I think just not necessarily allowing a valley to, again, induce fear but to have it to be an opportunity to go deeper into the space of trust and, and love. I always mm -hmm. laugh at myself because sometimes I can, I, I border that line of like hippie and then like New York <laughs> Jew all at the same time. Um, so I can go either way, but sometimes I say things like that and then I laugh a little bit depending on who's going <laughs> to listen. That's funny. I think, I think that's 
the challenge is to, you know, put all of that out there and, and that's what people are going to accept or they're not going to accept. And that makes it easier for you to relate when you actually get into working with them. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about on the individual level, then how is that different from working with an organization or do you treat them both the same? What a good question. I'm just taking a moment to think. I would like to say that I treat an organization similarly to how I treat an individual as normally I'm working with individuals within an organization, right? Um, Because I think it's very easy otherwise to say like us versus them or me versus you. Mm -hmm. And I think the way that I approach a client, which is different in coaching than therapy, I think often, Um, is we're on the same exact level. And it's like, I may be in the seat of the teacher, but I'm, you're, and you may be the student, but I'm learning so much from you at the same time. So I think I really approach my, any work um, experience or opportunity that I have as a mutually beneficial learning opportunity. Um, And, So I may have some stricter contractual rules with an organization, right? So Mm -hmm. uh, I have very, you know, a, a a very specific contract that I send over. But as I'm saying that, I also have one with clients. And I think that it really comes down to self responsibility and accountability. Mm -hmm. Um, I have noticed when I feel loose about those rules, whether it's, you know, cancellation or when a payment is due, um, people feel that and take advantage of that. I wish it wasn't the case, but I just think it's very true. And I, I've been burned enough to know not to do that. So mm-hmm. I've gotten stronger in my personal boundaries and what I need. Uh, and because of that, then there's there's not a lot of wiggle room for people to back out of something that they said they've committed to or not show up for a session. Um, it doesn't happen that often. Mm. So there is definitely a strength behind how you manage your business. I think people have a lot of misconceptions about people who run mindful businesses that you can, uh, you know, they're going to be airy fairy for lack of a better phrase. And that they're going to be a lot easier to push back against because, you know, they're all about mindfulness and they don't really understand what that means for one thing. (laughs) And the second is that, you know, they think that that's much easier to push back against a hippie than that New York Jew. So, you know, (laughs) which is, (laughs) How's that going to work? You know, um, yeah. so it sounds like you do really, you know, keep grounded in a in a point of strength in how you do your business. I have strong boundaries, uh, and I've learned them because in times when I haven't had them, I've been really hurt mm-hmm. um, or t- very taken advantage of. Um, And I was thinking, you know, oftentimes someone thinks of someone mindful or spiritual as sitting up, you know, on a hill for a year in silence or whatever it may be. And that's not the kind of mindfulness I'm really interested in. You know, Mm -hmm. I want to be a part of this life and experience um, what is going on in the world right now today. And to me, the true testimony to mindfulness is you know, being exposed to suffering or um, inequality or uh, someone screaming in your face and being able to, in that moment, go deep inside and and stay grounded in yourself and also say, okay, where is my responsibility in this? Mm. Where is my, I'm reacting. Why, uh, my reaction has nothing to do with that person. It has something to do with me. Um, And I'm much more interested in like, how can I be mindful in my actual life rather than how can I be mindful when I'm hanging out at a retreat center um, and meditating for multiple hours a day. And of course, that's a really fabulous thing to do so that you bring it into your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not something that you just go and do and then come back to your life. And it's, it's a completely different business, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. 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 So uh, Gail asked us a question. 
Um, she says, do you think people in general get the beauty or benefits of mindful living? And I'd like to project that a little bit into when you're talking to coaching people that may be more so than it is when you're approaching an organization. Is, have you found that to be a difference? Yeah. So <laughs> I'm trying. So the beauty and benefit of mindful living. I think uh, I definitely notice it more one, when I'm in a one-on-one -on -one interaction or a small group interaction versus giving a big, large talk to a company, right? It's just that the impact is greater um, to, to a certain extent. I, I really love doing group stuff. I really love giving talks. So um, it's, it's noticing, like, wh what's the level of impact? Um, I oftentimes that think, you know, people can be a little resistant or reticent at first or just skeptical, right? It's like, why am I going to pay attention to my feelings in a world that is telling me not to? Why am I going to take space when uh, everyone at my company is super high achieving? And if I do that, if I don't respond to my emails past 7 p.m., I'm going to be behind. Mm -hmm. Um but I think that when people get a little bit of time to see how their life starts to change and how there is a really deep sense of steadiness inside of oneself, that I do think they start to get the beauty and the benefit of mindful living. And I want to say it's hard work. Um, it's not... It, it doesn't, I don't think in the beginning it comes naturally and or easily. We aren't set up within a societal structure to support it. Um, you may lose a lot. You may lose a lot choosing to live in a mindful way. You may lose friendships. You may lose um, uh, family members, you know, may not understand it or agree with it. And you're basically losing an older version of yourself. You know, it's a shedding of a skin. Um, but to me, it's like, wh why else are we on this planet? Like, we're on this planet to me to reach a deeper and heightened state of freedom. I can only get that from within. Mm. Um, so to me, it's, it's about understanding that it's a practice, right? So it's a mindful living practice. Um, it's ever evolving, it's constantly changing, and it takes a lot of kindling all of the time. Mm. Um, and there will be days where you fall off. You know, there's days that I sit in my pajamas and eat junk food and watch television, right? Like, no, there's days that that <laughs> happens. And sometimes it feels really good. I just need it. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes I wake up the next day and I feel like I have a hangover. You know, it's sort of like a I, I did a really numbing, like something quite numbing, and I feel hungover from it. And so then it's like, okay, what do I need to do now to get back on it? And, it, and it's not like next week. It's like this next moment. You know, I, I always tell people, especially when I'm working with them on nutrition, each eating experience is a new eating opportunity. So if you ate five donuts for breakfast, that doesn't mean that your lunch all of a sudden has to be a burger and fries and you just say, you know, Excuse my I'm off the reservation. I'm exactly. You know, it's like once you press the, excuse my language, once you press the fuck it button, it's game over. So like don't press the button and just find a way to get back on the, on the horse. Mm. So how can we be more focused on that? Do you have uh, a particular practice that you teach people, you know, when they're, they're thinking about, okay, I screwed up this morning. Now, what am I going to do with the rest of the day? Is it a pause? Is it, breathing what do you what do you how do you help people achieve that both things you suggested are great <laughs> um so normally i would say start with a so when someone when that starts normally someone has an inner dialogue right so it's normally a, a shame spiral or a blaming or a judgment thing that's going on about themselves um so i think the first first and foremost is to be aware enough to notice you're going into this cycle Right. So I don't care if you you went into it, but it's saying, oh, I'm in my own shame spiral right now, you know, which is the I can't believe you ate that. I can't believe you did that. Um, what's wrong with you? You're not good enough. You're not worth it. 
Um, and sometimes what you can do in that moment is literally just slap yourself and say, stop <laughs> it. Stop it. Like, cut it out. Um, and then take, you know, I always like to say five deep breaths. It's like one is, it's good. It's, I don't feel like it's enough. I'm still in it. If I take really five full breaths, I feel like I'm dropped in a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and this is one of the first practices, you know, that I teach a lot of my clients that I want you to catch a thought that you're having or the many thoughts you're having that's out of alignment with the truth of who you are. So we're all whole, complete, and perfect exactly as we are. It's just that we've had years and layers of trauma and uh, stuff build up where we have masks and walls between that which is our true essence and that which we show out into the world. And what we start to say about ourselves is what we show out into the world, which is not actually what our true essence is. So mm -hmm. slap yourself across the leg, take five deep breaths, and... Uh, pay attention to a thought that you're having, right? So maybe it's what's wrong with me, I'm not good enough, and immediately change that thought, whether you're writing it or speaking out it out loud or inside of yourself, to be in alignment with who you are, what you want. I am a healthy eater. I am worth it. I'm good enough. I have a community of support that will help me get through this. Mm. I'm courageous, you know, whatever it may be, but using that, and, and then, you know, creating more or less a mantra around that to get you through just to the next thing, whether that's uh, getting yourself out to exercise or um, eating a salad instead of a basket of fries uh, or just to even empower you to have a challenging conversation um, because I think so much of it comes back to those moments of interaction with other people. Mm -hmm. And that brings you back to that self-knowledge that you forgot when you do it for the Cheetos. Right. Ex exactly. That you just, that went somewhere, but it's still inside of you. It didn't disappear. So you just still need to acknowledge it. Yeah. 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 Uh, one of an old um, members of mine who has written a lot of really great books, her name is Lissa Rankin. Um, yeah. And she, she calls it your inner pilot light. And I really love that because a pilot light is something that never goes out, right? Mm -hmm. It's like summer or winter, that thing still has this tiny blue flickering flame. Um, and the blue flame is the strongest flame, right? It's the like orange and yellows and reds that are not quite as fiery. Um, mm -hmm. And so if that blue part is always there and it never goes away, it doesn't mean it doesn't get really small sometimes. All you have to do is give it some oxygen to breathe and it starts to, to grow and create more of a, a roar inside of you. Mm. You used the word kindling earlier and I think that's a really appropriate word. Yeah. It, it really is. You got to keep feeding it so it doesn't go out. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. And again, it's a lot of hard work. <laughs> mm. Yeah. I think that's the other thing that people assume is, you know, I can, I can, decide that I'm going to do a particular practice, whether that's Qigong or yoga, or I'm going to meditate for an hour a day. And I'm telling you, right, well, I don't need to tell you, but I'm telling everybody else, you don't just sit down and meditate an hour a day and have that be the rest of your you life. Don't? You don't? Nobody really? does that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that easy. You have to work at it. That's why they call it practice. It's... um. There's so many things that you can do, though, um, you know, to lead up to that and to kind of build on it instead of trying to do everything at once. Because I run into a lot of people who try to do it all at once and then crash and burn and they wonder why. And mm. it, it's just not not that easy. And maybe baby steps do make a lot of sense, you know, thinking of easier ways. They do. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, the person who does it all at once looks like the hero. Uh it's the, the person that does it all at once is the hare in the race. The person that does it in the small, tiny steps is the tortoise who will cross the finish line and will not be burnt out and will be able to keep it up in a sustainable manner. And um, it's, I, I really, I cannot emphasize enough, small, small steps over a long period of time create lasting lifestyle change. Mm. I love that yeah. Gail just said, let's hear it for the tortoises in the world. <laughs> it's very sweet. 
Yeah, that's great, Gail. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and it's a building thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a building thing, not an instant right. kind of thing. So, okay. Well, um, I really enjoy talking with you, Ali. I always do. It's always, I always learn something from you. And uh, I really appreciate your time here today. Why don't you tell people a little bit more about how they can find you and um, how to get in touch with you? Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. It just is, uh, it's an honor and it's always a treat to get to talk with you. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so you can find me very easily through the internet. Now I do, I do have a website, even though technology is not my jam. Uh, so my website is my first name, A-L-L-I-E, and then my last name, Stark, S-T-A-R-K, the word wellness.com. And you can learn all about both my individual organizational services, and I also write a weekly blog and have been submitting publications to Conscious Evolution and Mind Body Green recently. So uh, writing is a really avid way to keep up with me more on the day-to-day. And um, you can find me online and learn about sessions or work for your organizations through there. Great. And I pasted the um, URL, Ali Stark Wellness, in the links. But you can also find it on the website, mindfulsocialmarketing.com. And this will be republished on YouTube and on Spreaker. So keep an eye out for those links. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ali. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.